To, to put this, my experience here in Uganda in, in space and time, COVID has been a thing in the world for over a year now. And it, people are just starting to move around again. The vaccines are out and, you know, I'm getting to travel, but COVID is still obviously something that I'm taking very seriously. The people of Uganda are taking very seriously. And I knew that I'm, I'm about to go see this vulnerable, endangered gorilla population. So it's really important for me that I go prepared and also in a way that is helpful to the, the local populations, the people, and as well as doing my best that I can to help protect the gorillas. So I wanted to get a chance to meet up with Dr. Gladys Kalima Zikasoka, who is a local expert and somebody who's been on the forefront of really doing some amazing conservation here in Uganda. Dr. Gladys Kalima Zikusoka is the founder of Conservation Through Public Health, which she founded because um, it's so easy for humans to transit, um, to transmit diseases to gorillas. Uh, we share more than 98% uh, shared DNA with them. So and her whole purpose with this organization was if I keep the community healthy, I can keep the gorillas healthy. So it involves uh, family planning, education, and constant monitoring of the gorillas and analyzation of their feces to see if they have anything. And if they do, they'll instantly come and um, tend to the gorillas, but it's really focusing on the community to make sure nothing transfers. And as part of that, they have an enterprise called Gorilla Conservation Coffee. So in this respect, they pay coffee farmers in the area premium wage, uh, premium cost for the coffee and this gives them income, so they're not going to be poaching in the forest to get uh, food for their families, they now have an income. And people from around the world can purchase Gorilla Conservation Coffee, whether it's from a local supplier, um, Oklahoma City Zoo has one, and uh, several websites. If you go to Uganda, go to Gorilla Conservation Cafe in Entebbe, um, with proceeds going towards CTPH and everything that they do. So it's a really fun enterprise. If you can't visit Uganda, look to contribute by purchasing some of that coffee. And they have a fun hashtag, uh, hashtag saving gorillas one sip at a time. So one of the things that I got to learn from Dr. Gladys is that one of the best things that I can do is just to be masked up at all times. Uh, so basically it was like my job to help the local communities stay healthy so that they can continue working, so that they can continue earning a living, as well as how with they, as the local communities interact with the gorillas as well, that they're not gonna be contracting COVID, that they're not gonna be getting sick, possibly dying. Uh, it, it was really inspiring to see what she's been up to here in Uganda. So, Dr. Gladys Kulima Zikusoka, did I get that kind of right? Yes, you did. You can feel, feel free to pronounce it how you would pronounce it. Yes, it's fun. Dr. Gladys Kalima Zikusoka. You say it much, much prettier than me, <laughs> as one could imagine. Uh, mm -hmm. So, can you tell me a little bit about where we are, uh, Gorilla Conservation Coffee, and how that ties into the work that you do? Yes, we're currently now at the Gorilla Conservation Cafe. Yeah. And um, we started this as a social enterprise in 2015 because we were concerned that people living around Windy Penetrable National Park, which is home to almost half of the world's endangered mountain gorillas, yeah. were not necessarily getting a fair market or steady price for their coffee. And yet other people were benefiting from tourism because since gorilla tourism began in 1993, they has been, you know, the community has really benefited a lot and they've started being lifted out of poverty. Yeah. But not everybody could be hired as a park ranger or be a porter who takes a tourist luggage to the gorillas or serve accommodation or food. Not everybody could be part of the tourism industry or yeah. sell crafts. And we realized that the coffee farmers were still going into the park to poach and collect firewood because they weren't getting enough money for their coffee. And yet they grow very good coffee. Yeah, I've heard and it's world-class coffee here. It is, it actually, and... Speaking of which, here we go. <laughs> Some of the world-class coffee. Thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate that. It actually earned 92 points in a coffee review. Really? It was among the top 30 coffees that were reviewed in 2018. We're really pleased about that. That's, that's yeah. fantastic coffee. Oh, thank you. So when, when somebody buys coffee, some of it's going directly to the farmers. Yes. To try to have a more sustainable way of life for the farmers. Yes. But then there's also a tie-in with the gorilla population and 
conservation through public health. Yes, there that's is. another organization that you started or you work with or help me understand that aspect. Yes, um, basically a donation from every bag sold goes to support the work of conservation through public health, okay. which is a non-profit, an NGO we founded in 2003, based on experiences I had working as a first veterinarian for the Uganda Wildlife Authority, where we had a skin disease outbreak in the gorillas, yeah. which was traced to people living around the park who were very poor. A baby gorilla died and the mm. rest only recovered when we treated them with ivermectin. Wow. And then there was another outbreak which occurred. And we realized that the only way that we could protect the gorillas is also by improving the health of the people who they come into close contact with. And so these are basically, when windy, when you get there, you find it's a very hard edge between the community and the park. So gorillas, once it was declared a national park, people couldn't cut trees anymore. Okay. And they okay. couldn't enter to log, but the gorillas come out because once they've lo lost their fear of people, when they've been habituated for tourism or research, they tend to go back to where the, their former ranges were. Yeah. And because the park is so small, even if there's only, now the numbers increased to 460 mountain gorillas, wow. it's still a small space for them yeah. and they need a bigger space. So we have an issue where gorillas are always coming out and we think that's where they got the scabies. They, got, they found dirty clothing on banana plants, yeah. you know, dirty clothing and a scarecrow that they put out to prevent gorillas eating banana plants and other, and other crops in the garden. We don't think it was because of tourists coming in because tourists are less likely to have scabies or psychoptic mange. It's a disease of inadequate hygiene, which is more likely for people who are impoverished, yeah. such as those living around Bindi. So we started CTPH to improve the health of the community together with the health of the gorillas. And later on, we realized that many people are unhealthy because they're poor. And that's how the coffee social enterprise really came in, Gorilla Conservation Coffee. That makes so and much sense. Yes. So the farmers get an above market price for good coffee. Yeah. And then they also, which encourages them to process the coffee properly, pick it at the right time, because they'll get a very good price for it, better yeah. than the market price. And a donation goes to support the community health, gorilla health work that we do and uh, conservation education programs around the park. Wow. So it's um, a way of providing sustainable financing for conservation, but in all that way, you're saving gorillas just by... Well, that it makes so much sense. Buying a bag of coffee or... Yeah, but if the gorilla population is healthy, it's a lot influenced by the health of the population of everyone that interacts with the gorillas. So the tourists, but also the people who just live around there. Yes. So you're working to make sure that everyone is healthy, which therefore helps the conservation of and health of the gorillas. Yes, and when the gorilla population is healthy, then the populations will grow. Yeah. And it's also good for tourism. So it ends up being a, a positive yeah. cycle as opposed to a negative cycle. Ne as opposed to being a vicious cycle, now we break that vicious cycle and becomes a an very- upward cycle. Exactly, yeah. it's an upward cycle because when you have healthy gorillas, um, because people are healthy, the gorillas are healthy, the numbers grow and tourism grows. Yeah. Tourism has really changed the communities. Mm. Um, and even some of those tourists visit the coffee farmers. We organize coffee safaris for people who come to the park, really? where you can, after tracking gorillas, the next day you can visit a coffee farm, learn how coffee is grown. We have Arabica and Robusta wow. coffee. The one we, you're drinking right now is Arabica coffee. And people can tell the difference between the two yeah. and how it's processed. And it's, for people, it's a really interesting experience. And they learn how this coffee is helping to save gorillas. So even the coffee farmers have suffered because of a breakdown in tourism, which right. came about because of COVID-19. Yeah. yeah. So I'm about to go travel to Windy yes. and go do some gorilla trekking. And so what I think is really helpful for me to understand this context of if I'm healthy, if I'm wearing masks and things like that, yes. as well as the other tourists that I'm with, I'm hoping to protect the gorillas, the guides, everybody. But is there something that you would want other people, myself included, to know about what it's like to go or any like, um, what would you like me to know or anybody else about traveling to the gorillas uh, and how to help basically yes. and have a good experience while doing so? Yes, um, we are closely related to mountain gorillas. We share 98.4% genetic material so we can easily make each other sick and that's how they yeah. got the scabies but they've also picked up respiratory diseases from people. Sometimes it's been the local communities, sometimes it's been tourists, 
um, not only necessarily in Buindi, but in other great ape populations in Africa, yeah. like where chimpanzees and gorillas are found. So there have been a number of common flu viruses that have spread from people to gorillas and chimpanzees. And we were always concerned about COVID-19 because it's a very severe form of a common flu, mm -hmm. um, as in it's highly contagious, but it also affects the lungs. Yeah. So once the COVID-19 pandemic began, uh, Conservation to Public Health worked very closely with the Uganda Wildlife Authority to upgrade the gorilla volume rules. And we also worked with other NGOs that work with gorillas in the area. And we held training workshops. The Wildlife Authority was convinced that it's really important for people to wear masks. Because we're looking on the TV and everyone, people started to wear masks. COVID, well, amongst, COVID only got to Uganda towards the end of March. Really? Um, so later than other countries. Yeah. But just even before it arrived, we already planned to train the park staff to put on masks. To, and the social distance was increased. We've always been talking about distance, yeah. social distancing, long before the pandemic began. Because ever since guerrilla tourism began, it's always been like we're concerned about making them sick. Mm -hmm. Tourists could bring a fatal flu like COVID-19. Yeah. And actually, that, that's why I was hired as a first vet for the Uganda National Parks. Because they were worried that, you know, people would make gorillas sick and they needed to hire a full-time vet. Yeah. And so it used to be seven meters prior to the pandemic. And the government, Uganda Wildlife Authority, increased it to 10 meters okay. just to be extra sure that the gorillas are safe from our diseases. And then at the same time, everyone has to wear a mask. And there's very strict hand hygiene, boot disinfection. Your boots will be disinfected before you start the trek. And just as you get to the gorillas, they'll be disinfected again. Really? Yeah. And so okay. will your hands. And also everyone's temperature will be taken as you're entering the park gate. Sure. Um, just to make sure. It's just another way to assess whether you could be infectious. Yeah. And then, obviously, you've come from America, so you were tested before you entered Uganda. Yeah. So all of that is sorted out. So we want to, as much as possible to keep the gorillas safe. And even if we've not had COVID-19 in the mountain gorillas, thankfully, touch wood, it will never happen. There has actually been, as much as we suspected that COVID-19 can easily spread from people to gorillas, it finally happened in uh, America recently. I heard about that in San yes. Diego, is that correct? Yes, in the San Diego Zoo. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, the gorillas in the collection got COVID-19 from an asymptomatic keeper who was wearing masks. And they wow. think, but of course, in a captive situation, you get much closer to the gorillas. Yeah. Because they, you know, they feed them, they clean their enclosures. So it's not, you don't get that close to the wild gorilla. And also it's indoors, whereas in Buindi, it's outdoors. Yeah. And the rate of virus spread outdoors is much less than indoors. So yeah. that will help protect the gorillas to a certain extent. Because you can only see them outside, they're wild animals. But um, yeah, but it, it was a wake-up call that we really have to be strict about the regulations yeah. and make sure that the rangers who are always spending a lot of time with them are, he are healthy, they're hygienic, they're keeping a safe distance away, you know, they're wearing masks. And the tourists like you who are going to visit for a short time, are also doing the same. So we're on high alert for that. Yeah. And uh, we are also testing the gorilla fecal samples. Because actually in San Diego, so they use fecal samples to test, which yeah. is great because it's non-invasive and that's mm -hmm. perfect for wildlife. So we can go to their night nests. Every night a gorilla makes a nest to sleep in. And we're at bed. Yeah. Very comfortable bed, actually. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm really tired from checking, I want to sleep in them. <laughs> <laughs> So they make a really nice nest every night. And just as they're getting up in the morning, they normally defecate in it. Yeah. And so if you, get there, if you go there the very next day, it's still fresh enough to collect the sample and look for any kind of disease. We've been doing this since we started the organization, yeah. Preservation for Public Health. But now the disease that we're mainly focusing on right now is you know, SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19. And so, so all of that is part of a way of preventing and making sure the gorillas are not picking up something. Yeah. But also we are working closely with the Uganda Wildlife Authority to make sure that their staff are tested for COVID-19, which they have, um, just to make sure that the whole cycle is be being catered for.